Welcome to Meekum Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. It's the show geared toward keeping you up to speed with the latest auto news, event coverage, and expert industry insight. Now, here are your hosts, Matt Avery and John Craman. Hey, and welcome to another Meekum On The Move podcast. Uh, I'm Matt Avery, and joining me is co-host John Craman. And John, we've got a really exciting show in the works. Uh, we've got yeah. a really neat interview with a motorcycle expert, Paul Dorleon. He's a regular around the Meekum auctions, motorcycle auctions. Yeah, right. Uh, so really neat conversation with him talking about um, all kinds of things. But before we get to it, we've got a lot of car news. Uh, a lot is going on. Speaking of things going on, we've got a pretty robust Meekum schedule for the rest of the year. What's in store uh, when it comes to Meekum auctions? What we got? Well, uh, Matt, as you know, uh, Meekum Kissimmee in the books with an all-time auction record of $217 million in sales. But you know what, man? We've got 11 more wow. collector car auctions coming up for uh, the remainder of our 2022 year with lots of coverage on Motor Trend. But and of course, more about that as the year continues. But looking forward to the next auction, of course, is the Glendale, which is the Phoenix area auction. Mm -hmm. It's March 16th through the 19th at State Farm Stadium. Uh, later that month, uh, on March 31st through April 2nd, we head over to Houston, Houston to the NRG Center. May 13th through the 21st, the granddaddy of all Meekum auctions, Matt. That's Dana Meekum's 35th original Spring Classic. Uh, that's Indianapolis, Indiana at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, June 9th through 11th, we're back to Tulsa at Expo Square, July 7th through the 9th. Orlando Summer Special has been announced, going back there again for the third time in Florida in the summer, second time in Orlando at the Orlando Convention Center. Nice and cool there in mm -hmm. July, I promise you, in the building. <laughs> July 27th through the 30th, back to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at the Farm Show Complex, Matt. We've missed that show Right. for the obvious reasons for the right. past couple of years so much pent-up demand there that's going to be a lot of fun august 18th through the 20th out to monterey california the hyatt regency hotel at the del monte golf course back to dallas in september the 7th through the 10th k bailey hutchinson convention center october 13th through the 15th chicago at the schaumburg convention center las vegas nevada at the big las vegas convention center november 10th through the 12th and the tradition continues we finish out the collector car auction schedule in kansas city december 1st through the 3rd at kansas city convention center also referred to as bartle hall what an amazing <laughs> collector car year this is going to be on the Meekum schedule we're all going to be very busy yeah no slowing down Speaking of no slowing down, John, let's talk about some car news because one of the uh, the hottest uh, bits out there is Ford. It seems like Ford has had a, a really good run of, I'm saying over the last year and probably even two years in terms of keeping the car news buzzing right. with hot products, stuff that people like, especially enthusiasts. And so finally, at long last, we have the final information or we have the latest round of information about a vehicle we knew was coming, Bronco Raptor. So this is the the big bad, the big bad one that's set even more so for off-road. We know a couple things about it. And okay. so what we know is it's only going to come in four door. Right. And I think maybe maybe the biggest surprise is what what's under the hood. Ford is not doing a V8, which there was some rumors, there were some wishes, some hopes. It's a V6. So with that and some of the other specs that we know, John, what are your thoughts? Is this is this a stopgap? Are we going to see an even bigger and badder wrapper coming? Or is this really what Ford says is dialed all the way up? That is the big question that's out there buzzing in the Bronco world. They haven't released a horsepower rating for the Bronco Raptor, although we're expecting it's going to be probably somewhere in the 400 horsepower range out of the twin turbo 3 liter. Now, they've got the 3.5 liter V6 right. that's used in the F-150 Raptor. More so than thinking that maybe the Coyote V8 would be the power plant of choice for the Bronco Raptor. I was really thinking I would in fact put money on it that it would have been the three five, but they went with the three liter, still gonna have plenty of pep at four hundred horsepower. Uh, I have seen some people out there wondering when and are are they going to make it in a two door version? <laughs> From what I've been able to kind of read between the lines, it looks like because of the extended wheelbase mm -hmm. of the four door and stability uh, for high uh, high clearance off-road travel uh, they're probably not going to make the two-door version right what are your thoughts on the new bronco raptor it's it's going to be hot that i know right well you know you and i are, are in agreement that the bronco came at the right time it does have some of the right design elements to really touch on the nostalgia and i say yep. some of the right elements because you and i 
firmly believe that if you want to maximize your retro charm, it's got to be the two door. The four yep. door. Now again, that's just retro charm. It has nothing to do with off road capability. Nothing to do with driving. Exactly. It's strictly just from a looks cosmetic. Yeah. However, the four door is going to be the sales leader. Jeep saw that with Wrangler when they offered the four door instead of the two door. Sales went through the roof. Yeah, the unlimited. Yeah. So it's one of those things of like it makes total sense. Um, from this standpoint, I will say I like a two door out on the trail because it is smaller. It is more nimble. You can get to okay. tighter places. Okay. Makes sense. Know, but. I understand that when you have an extra row of seats, you have you can double the fun, you can bring more friends. It's more of a it's more of a family or friends cruiser. So I get it. The other thing that you and I have talked about is nothing to do with performance and capability, but the styling of this one, it's got some pretty wild fender flares. It's got some other stuff on it, optimizing it for trail use. You're not the biggest fan of those. Right? It just right? looks it's awful wide. You know, I've gotten right. I've gotten so used and used to now and comfortable with the look of the new Bronco. I'm just crazy think the styling is just i think that they nailed it and now that they've got this it's it's pretty wild is all i can say and but you, you know you made a good point if you're going to be taking this thing off road you mentioned you know going out to moab to the real serious places that's really what you really need to take is something with this type of capability and to have that capability you got to have that right that that real husky look well and the other the other thing to keep in mind john is that while ford designs this to be thrashed and abused yep. we see as many raptor f-150s around the streets of chicago and in the midwest so it, frankly it doesn't really matter in terms of obviously ford designs a vehicle but it's red hot right now to buy off-road vehicles so it will be i think it will be a sales leader for sure i think it will be yeah. too i just wanted just a final comment on it um from my perspective i'm a v8 guy i'm a horsepower right. guy i like the performance i have to say that uh at a base price of around seventy thousand dollars for another ten thousand dollars there is a potential competitor out there that folks i think are going to be thinking about and that would be the jeep wrangler 392 that's 470 horsepower versus the predicted 400 and all done with a normally aspirated 6.2 liter hemi v8 if it was me i think i'd probably lean towards the jeep as okay. much as i love the new broncos uh, okay I, I i'm i'm still on team bronco <laughs> okay I, I think fair enough after seeing it up close uh over several different media drives and actually seeing it out in public I kind of think that Bronco is a little bit more refined of a Wrangler. I mean, they had more, they had more white space to work with. So there's some things on it that I like that for my money, I'd buy the Bronco. So okay. um, keeping the theme on off-road and trucks and Ford, you had some details on Maverick, which is another Ford product that you and I like. It seems like it's a, a winner. Uh, what's the latest or what did you find on that? Yeah, it's a home run all the way. Um Ford has just made an announcement due to high demand. They've closed the orders for the remainder of the 22 model year. They just don't want more people upset that they can't get their vehicles it's fast good, enough. It's a good problem to have. So it is a good problem. <laughs> you know, keep in mind that is a great looking little truck. It's a unibody truck mm -hmm. with front wheel drive. There's a hybrid uh, option with a CVT with a with a normally aspirated four cylinder. And then there's an optional two liter uh, turbocharged uh, inline four that drives the front wheels, or it's also available in all-wheel drive. That's got a conventional 10-speed uh, automatic transmission. But base price on the Maverick run st starts at 20 and nicely equipped in the mid-20s and a pretty well-equipped Lariat top of the line with all the goodies, uh, but tops out about $32,000. So the market on that's hot right now. Uh, and, you know, what's happening is, is, is Ford taking advantage of their market dominance in trucks mm -hmm. uh, to the point where they just announced, we both saw it, uh, news just with really within the past week or two, where Ford just built their 40 millionth F-Series truck. That is an astonishing number. Well, and they keep upping that each year, John, with being a sales leader with the F-150, seems like that really is the standard go-to truck. Right. And like you said about Maverick, Ford is really doubling down on that And I, uh, in terms of offering trucks of all sizes to customers. What I thought was interesting about that when we talk about trucks and with so many being sold of the F-150 and when you combine in the competitors from Ram and Chevy, what I'm excited for is maybe a different class of truck. You mentioned the Maverick. You and I grabbed lunch a couple of days ago and we saw one of Hyundai Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. We like, loved it. And we like it. So I will yeah. say I'm excited to see a return to smaller trucks. 
I think that's a little bit, I don't know, it's just, it's a need to see the return of that. Well, just to, just to kind of put an exclamation point on it, Ford right now in their, their standard duty or their consumer grade trucks, really three right now, the mm -hmm. F-150 series, and then down a notch from that, of course, the Ford Ranger, which we'll call that a midsize truck, and then the new compact truck, the new Ford Maverick, which they claim is attracting a slightly younger buyer than typical. And keep in mind, Ford is no longer producing any passenger cars, keyword car, right. with the exception of cars that have the Mustang banner. That would be the traditional ICE Mustang and, of course, the all-electric Mustang Mach-E. They're thinking that they're drawing buyers into the Ford family that maybe would have bought maybe a Fusion or a Focus or something like that. They don't make them anymore, and they're 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 jumping in on the Maverick bandwagon. Right. Something's going right for them on it, for yeah, sure. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, speaking of going right, the C8 Corvette, yeah. now in its third year production, right? Correct? 22s have been, are starting to reach dealerships, or where do we stand with that? No, 22s are out, and or can out. you believe it? Okay. They're going to start production on the 2023s okay. in May of this year. It's only a few months away. Yeah. So that'll be going into the fourth production model year. It just seems like that they're just started to come out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that and then also Bronco, you had identified about how even the Bronco now as it gets into its, uh, are we into the second model Just year? Still 2022. Still 22. Yeah. But both seem to be red hot with consumers. Yeah. It and seems I, like, right? And, right. And I think it's worth mentioning because we see such a high quantity of, well, Corvettes of all vintage, of course, world's number one Corvette seller at auction. But the C8 in particular, doesn't matter the year and even the miles don't seem to hurt up much. They still are fetching well over MSRP as are the Broncos as well. So a couple of really white hot markets that do not seem like that they're cooling off at all. And as we wrap up, John, uh, big pony car news, yeah. a segment that you and I love talking about. Yep. Uh, there has been a reshuffling of the sales leaders, and we kind of saw it coming. We saw it coming. Uh, so the big three, let's just identify them. You have the Dodge Challenger, you have Chevy Camaro, and then you have Ford Mustang. Right. And for many, many years, it was always Ford Mustang was the number one seller consistently month after month, year after year. Camaro was in second place. Yep. And Challenger really lagged behind since it debuted in 08. It took a couple years to catch up. And then what was it about? I think we were talking off air a couple years ago. It quietly or maybe not quietly rumbled past pretty quietly Camaro <laughs> pretty quietly uh, it rumbled past Camaro into second place and then in the last couple of weeks it has now been crowned the number one pony car seller surpassing Mustang yeah and that's incredible Matt when you consider that the basic platform and the basic car mm -hmm. Challenger literally dates back to 2008 but you know it does not seem to bother the buyers of that car Dodge has done an extraordinary job, better than Ford and better than Chevrolet with the Camaro, of not only building performance cars, they all do. Right. And not only building cars that will hold up under abuse uh, and love, but cars that really tap into the heritage of the legendary 1970 through 1974 Dodge Challenger. Their theory has been, why mess with a good thing? This has been a good seller. It's a good platform. They've been able to refresh that car and re-identify that car, yet keeping its retro roots. Yeah, it's bigger than the other two. It's heavier, but it doesn't seem to matter. It's a car that just continues to seem to gain fans. And even with the, the uh, thought of a brand new Mustang coming out. In fact, there's been spy photos of the next generation Mustang. I expect we'll see it in the next couple of years. So we'll have the same generation Challenger maybe leading the, the sales over two different transitions of platforms for the Camaro and the Mustang that the Challenger is exceeding. It's pretty pretty crazy scenario when you think about it. Mecham Auctions is proud to bring you On The Move with Matt Avery and John Craman. For more on the world of collector cars, head over to Mecham.com. Now let's get back to the show. Matt, it is my pride and my pleasure to introduce a very special next guest. Now, this is a guy that I've known for a while. His name is Paul Dorleon, and he is... Wait, I'm wait, wait. That is awesome. You totally Did I nailed get it? it. Oh, for, Paul, for the first time in my life, I got it. Thank you. It will never happen again, for the record. So thank you for saying that. But you coached me for about three minutes before we went on the air here. But anyway, Paul is very, very well known throughout the motorcycling 
industry spanning literally well over 100 years of motorcycling history. In fact, probably closer to 130 years. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I honestly consider Paul as the world's number one expert in vintage motorcycling. Some of his background includes, he's a writer, he's a writer, he's a judge, he's a museum curator, and he's also a tintype photographer. He joins us at Mecham Auctions for the motorcycle auctions as our guest TV announcer, and he is one of the most interesting guys that I think that we've maybe <laughs> had on the podcast. Matt, you've had a chance to kind of get acquainted with him. Now we're going to bring Paul in. Paul, Matt, thanks so much for taking some time out with Matt and I to talk a little bit about your background and a lot about motorcycles. Cool. Yeah, it's great to meet you guys. Okay, well, so let's... Of course, I've known you for years. Yes. So. <laughs> well, let's do this. Let's take us back so folks can get a feel for what you're all about. Take us back to your youth. Where did you get bitten by the motorcycle bug? And while you're thinking about that, it's interesting that you never really got bit too hard by the car bug. Is that correct? Actually, that's not true. Okay, I, go ahead. I Fill us a, in. I had a whole stream of uh, vintage sports cars. Uh, 61 flat floor E-type. Mm. Roadster. Okay. That counts. <laughs> yeah, that, that counts. counts. All right. <laughs> I, had, I had a Lotus Cortina. I had a Lancia Zagato. Love it. Love I had it. an MG Magnet, you know, Saab convertibles, you know, lots and lots of sports cars that I had a lot of fun with. Um, ultimately, I found that, uh, well, I was a, a hooligan, you know, in my in my 20s and 30s, and I just loved speed. And, and I was looking for the same kind of thrill that I got from a motorcycle with a car which you can do, but usually the wheels are, all four wheels are sliding. And, uh, you know, I just realized at some point, you know, I, I went to a vintage sports car rally that a friend organized and he had a terrible accident. And uh, uh, um, I just realized that, that the speeds that I was enjoying were, were probably not just going to kill me, but maybe somebody else too. And it seemed the more responsible thing just to stay on a motorcycle where I'm likely just to kill myself if I'm, you know, really, really, you know, flat out all the time, which I was, and I survived, you know, and, and in truth, I don't know that many people who really crashed when they were going fast. If, if they were really skilled enough to ride quickly, you know, people usually have big accidents when they're in cities and people yep, turn and left in front of them. That's it. Happened to me. <laughs> Guilty. Yeah. 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 Anyway. So what year did you acquire your first motorcycle? Uh, 1979. And what uh, was it? It was a Honda Express, which was like oh, my this goodness. crazy little 50cc thing. It was you this, admit that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. It was this All right, obnoxious fair green, like only in, you know, 1970s <laughs> green. It had a, it didn't have a proper Kickstarter. It had a spring winder. So it looked like a Kickstarter, but you were actually winding up a spring. And then it had a starter release button it. on the handlebar to release it. It was yeah, a cool. pretty genius. Uh, it was totally reliable. I knew nothing. And I bought it because I was uh, 16, no, I was 15 years old. And I had uh, investigated how to get out of high school. And because high school in Stockton, California was a pretty scary place in 1978. Mm. So I uh, uh, found that if I took three classes uh, at the local community college at night, I could graduate a whole year early. So this little, and there was no way I was going to take the bus at night in Stockton, which was actually the murder capital of the United States at the time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was quite grateful to the little, little, little motorcycle for ferrying me back and forth to, to school long enough to graduate and leave. And I didn't have a bike at university. I went to UC Santa Cruz yeah. and, um, but uh, banana slug i was a slug yeah i did ride a little <laughs> bit i borrowed some bikes but i met this guy who uh his name was henry i can't remember his last name henry collected italian exotic motorcycles he had like a duck egg green ducati 750 super sport and laverda sfc all these crazy i knew nothing about this was like wow. a whole other world and you know the bike that caught my attention was a little gelera 150 from mm -hmm. like the early 60s had a beautiful like two-tone red and white paint job and sweeping fenders and I don't know, it completely charmed me. And that was my first kind of like inkling that maybe this is something I wanted to pursue. So after college, actually, I worked with uh, a fellow who was a journeyman printer. We would print books and uh, punk rock show flyers and all sorts of stuff in my mother's basement. So we dragged a big printer from his, his boss's print shop, some obsolete multilith. And, uh, he rode a 1950 BMW R6 or R50 that he had found, uh, under a, a staircase. And it, I loved it. It was totally patina. He didn't touch it. He just got it running. 
And he let me ride it all over the place. And, you know, probably within a few months I had bought a BMW of my own and that was my first proper motorcycle. And, you know, it snowballed from there. <laughs> well, and you mentioned that that's where your love started. You want to do more of it. So was that from a collecting st- side? Was that from a journalist side or how did you start to kind of move from hobbyist to profession? Well, that didn't happen for decades. Okay. You know, uh, I was just an obsessed motorcycle, you know, enthusiast. And I became really, really curious about motorcycle history. Uh, and probably the, the worst slash best thing anybody ever did for me was this fellow, Jim, who was the printer. He had been buying a uh, classic bike and classic motorcycle magazine since issue one. Now, in 1984, issue one was only, you know, three years ago. So it was <laughs> one milk crate of these magazines. And, you know, I just devoured those things. And that was the start of my education about motorcycle history and I became fascinated and and a lot of the, they wrote such good stories about these bikes because at that time, the journalists who were writing those magazines had actually road tested those bikes when they were new. Right. And they were all old guard. They wrote beautifully. And there was just this fabulous romance about motorcycles in these British magazines. So I kind of got interested in a couple of the magazines that were featured. I wanted to know about Velocets. I wanted to know about Norton's. And so I, I was a house painter at the time. I made decent money and bikes were cheap in the eighties. So I would rarely pay more than 500 to a thousand dollars for a motorcycle. And, you know, I could try it out. If I didn't like it, I'd just sell it and get something else. And eventually, you know, I would have 30 or 40 bikes in a warehouse and kind of rotating them around and buying and selling. And my interest was always in kind of upgrading my collection. So eventually I was buying full on racing bikes as Manx Norton's and, rough superiors and really interesting stuff because I wanted to ride them. And, and I did, I rode them all on the street. Your knowledge level is extraordinary. Where did you pick up all the nuances? Did it come naturally? Did you just remember everything that you read or did you do serious studying? Well, I mean, I did do serious studying. I read constantly and I, uh, uh, I bought every motorcycle book that I could find <laughs> I went around to every used bookshop uh, in San Francisco and bought every motorcycle book I could find like for for years. And, you know, for 10 or 20 bucks a pop, you know, I suddenly had a a library of hundreds of books, even in the, even in the late eighties. And I found that that was invaluable and really informed my ability to move around in the world and find really interesting motorcycles. So eventually by the, let's say by the late eighties, I was, you know, buying bikes in, you know, Australia or Argentina or Uruguay or Europe and London. I was traveling to see, to see these bikes and making friends. And so even, you know, long before the internet and long before blogs and websites, you know, I had, I just met so many people, you know, just roving around the world and, you know, being in owner's clubs was a great way to connect with other enthusiasts. And so people, knew who I was and knew that I kind of knew what I was talking about. And, um, eventually that led to me being asked to judge shows. Um, probably the most famous was the, uh, legend of the motorcycle exhibit that happened at, uh, the, the Ritz Carlton and half moon Bay for three years in the mid two thousands. And, uh, that was really a, uh, that was the watershed event, uh, in a lot of people's lives. It was the first time that the motorcycle world had really coalesced or let's say the yeah, I would say the wider motorcycle world because there were customizers there, there were vintage enthusiasts, there was industry there and former industry and racers. And I mean, everybody who was anybody in the in the motorcycle world showed up for this event. And I met them all because I was a judge for three years. And uh, it was it, it changed my life. And it's also when I started my blog was the first uh, was the first event in 2006. So let's go ahead and talk about that. The vintage, uh, before we started, you told me that you kind of consider it your media hub. For our listeners, fill us in on what vintage means and how they can connect with you via that. Uh, For sure. Via the vintage. <laughs> For sure. Um, yeah, the, the, the word was invented in the late 30s when people were starting to collect and, and restore old vehicles, cars and motorcycles. And you know, club members, it's an English term, although it spread to the colonies uh, in the 1970s, there was actually an Australian magazine called The Vintage. And uh, I didn't know that when I started my blog, I just know that. <laughs> sure um, you didn't. 
<laughs> don't sue me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but in, uh, uh, let's say, in, when I joined the Vintage Motorcycle Club in England in the in the eighties, uh, Titch Allen was the like lifetime president, and he had used the term a lot when he mm. founded the VMCC in whatever nineteen forty seven. Just in conversation and in print, just to yeah. define in his writing, he would it, use that term it. for an enthusiast. And I just I like the word; it's yeah. a cool word. Yep. Yeah. And, you know right. that, that concatenation. You know, so uh, when it was kind of odd how I started my blog, I was actually well, you can't tell because it's a podcast, but I like clothes. And my mother was a fashion designer. I had a grandmother that taught at Parsons mm. and was an editor at Vogue. Kind of runs in my blood and uh i was actually photographed on a very famous fashion blog called the sartorialist in mm. 2006 october 2006 and i wanted to comment on his blog and at the time google made it easier to comment on the blog if you started a blog it was like a, it was like amway or pyramid scheme <laughs> yeah. or something you know <laughs> and uh so i just picked the name the vintage and wow. there we went you know uh it started out very slowly i didn't know what i was doing i had always been a writer but I had never done it regularly. Uh, so, and I, like I had been the editor of club newsletters and, okay. you know, before that I had written in school and things like that, school newspaper kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, so I started out really slowly, you know, maybe a post every couple of weeks. Uh, and then I started to get attention, you know, like a couple hundred people were reading this stuff and I, and I got kind of excited and, People started saying, you know, talking to Myers, like, you know, Paul, this is going to be your next career. You should probably take this seriously. <laughs> and so I did. I, I kind of challenged myself to post uh, every other day for a year oh. in 2007. And nice. I went from 500 views a day to 5,000 views a day. So, and things just kind of grew from there. And I got a, a reputation and, you know, I carried on. Let's say after 10 years, I, I, I met a fellow named Sasha Cherevkov in New York who was, uh, had, I was involved in a film festival in New York for three years and the, he, this Sasha had built the website for the film festival. And, uh, I asked him if he would build, rebuild the website for the vintage as a modern, you know, website instead of just on the, the Google blogger format. And, uh, he asked me, he said, well, what's your, what's your goal? You know, what's, what are you going to do with this? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'd really like to include film and I'd like to start doing museum exhibits connected with this. And I'd like to start doing, you know, more books and, you know, kind of create a media hub and plus all the films from the film festival have nowhere to live really. And so said, so if we could integrate all that kind of stuff in one place, uh, I, that's what I'd like to do. And he says, okay, I'm on board. So wow. he, uh, score, he, he score, yeah. right. The yeah, right, yeah. the right partner, yeah. you know, a guy who builds websites for banks, you know, who likes motorcycles. So he did it pro bono and as a partner and, uh, completely transformed the look and feel of it. And, and also transformed basically how, uh, the vintage exists in the world as a, as a media hub. Where do you see yourself as a motorcycle enthusiast and expert from the pecking order of maybe anybody else that might be, for lack of a better word, a competitor of yours? Is there anybody else out there that's as intense and enthusiastic and knowledgeable as you are? Well, uh, in the in the motorcycle world, motorcycle oh, of world, of course, of course there are. But you know, I have well, I don't know why I have I'm really comfortable in front of a camera. Okay. As you have found, mm -hmm. I'm comfortable in front of a microphone and not everybody is. And there are definitely people I know who are, you know, I bow down to and be, for their specific knowledge, you know, like I've never restored a Harley Davidson. And there are people out there who really can tell you literally every nut and bolt on a Harley Davidson. And I have nothing but respect for those people, but they know nothing about, let's say film, or they know nothing about, you know, antique British mics or Italian right. or German. So you know, I'm kind of a generalist and I have this yep. weird brain that just holds everything and I'm interested in everything. So I've written a book about choppers and cafe racers and, you know, just use the same research skills that I've learned, you know, researching obscure old motorcycles and brought it to bear in other, way, other ways. So you've got a, a wide range, Paul, but I'm guessing that you probably still have some certain niches, niches that really get you excited when it comes to bikes, what are, what are some of those? Is it brands? Is it particular year make models or what are the bikes in your mind that are kind of at the pinnacle in your mind of collecting or enjoyment? 
Yeah, you know, I just got, I'm consulting on a book for Tashin right now. It's called, called The Ultimate Collector's Motorcycle Book or something like that. Sorry, <laughs> Tashin, I can't remember. <laughs> but, um, uh, and, uh, you know, they asked me a bunch of questions and, and asked, you know, what kind of a collector are you? And I said, well, actually, I'm not a collector at all. Uh, I buy bikes to ride and I've got a dozen bikes and I ride them all and I have them because... I find them aesthetically really beautiful mm. and they'll also hold up to the abuse that I deliver. So I've ridden across the United States four times on vintage motorcycles on the cannonball. And, you know, I've been a breath superior owner since the eighties and I've found that actually they hold together. Like I did two cross country trips without problems on breath superiors, which is pretty rare. You say you've ridden cross country and a cannonball on vintage motorcycles. For our listeners that may not know what that means, and I know what the answer to this is, but I want you to define it. Let everybody know exactly what year range that you will be riding typically and what type of cycles will will participate. Yeah. This is pretty incredible. Yeah, it's an it's an amazing event. It's it's called technically called the Motorcycle Cannonball Endurance Rally. And uh it's open to you know 1867 from the first motorcycle uh to well the, the end date varies. You know, sometimes it's been like 100 years from the date of the the event. So, I think in in the very first one uh in 2010 the it was a pre 1916 rally. So it was, I think, cross country, 60 pre 1916 wow. motorcycles. So uh, the date's been kind of fungible, and I've ridden it on a 1928 Veloset, a 1925 Bruff Superior, a 1933 Bruff Superior. Actually, the fourth trip, I should say, I didn't ride, I just took wet plate tin type photographs of the rider. So, and that's a book that I'm working on right now. So let's talk about that for just a moment. Tin type photography. Is that all kind of a lost art? Are you sort of the sole, um, <laughs> pr- pr- proprietor of that? Or is it a little bit more common than we think and explain to the folks what, what that's all about? Yeah. So if you've ever seen a picture of Abraham Lincoln or the civil war, you're looking mm-hmm. at a wet plate photograph or a tin type. Uh, if it was shot on glass, it's called an amber type. But those are technical terms for basically it's a byproduct of, of DuPont's uh, uh, dry, smokeless gunpowder research. They created this stuff called collodion, which was kind of the first plastic. Uh, you can pour it out, and it, because it's got ether as a, as a solvent, wow. it dries very quickly. And it turned out that you could uh, soak a still damp, a uh, piece of glass or a piece of tin that you've poured collodion on into a silver nitrate bath, and voila, you've got a piece of film. So it's a it's a direct positive image, and it's it's very simple chemistry. Everything. So I do all this photography with my girlfriend Susan McLaughlin. She's the one that got me into it. Oh, I was a I did a lot of photography in college, and I had my own dark room that I built in my garage. But she got me into these antique processes and. Uh, She's the president of the board of something called the Penumbra Foundation in New York, which is all about uh, antique or, or alternative photographic processes. But it's a very difficult process, wet plate. And doing it in a truck, uh, in a van, going across country, you have to develop it immediately after you take the photograph. So um, you're jumping in and out of a van with safe lights <laughs> on it. It's crazy. <laughs> Now, forgive my ign- ignorance, is this the type of camera where you put the black cloth over your head and you hold up the thing that goes pop, right? Is, <laughs> we we don't right? use a flash, but yes, yeah, okay. we, we put a dark okay. cloth over our head wow. so we can focus. Basically, yeah. what we do is we, on the cannonball, we'd flag somebody over to a picturesque spot we'd found, you know, we'd have the camera ready, we'd focus, one of us would jump in the van, soak the plate pull it out, you know, stick it in the camera, take the photograph, jump back in the van, develop it. If it looked good, we'd wave them on. They could go. If there was a problem, we'd take another one. (laughs) And, you know, so each, each photograph took maybe 15 minutes. Well, like uh, John said, I'm, I'm curious, Paul, you know, you've, you've got a love for it, but is that growing? It seems like in general, just from, from looking at what's hot right now, it seems like there is a lot of people that are embracing older technologies and things. So I would think that while it sounds archaic, is there a growing community? I mean, like John said, are you the last guy that can do it? Surely you're not. But, <laughs> Absolutely I mean. not. It was a lost okay. art 
uh, let's say, and for a lot of the 20th century. Okay. And it was revived in the 80s by some really eccentric folks who like read books and figured out how to do it. Uh, but um, <laughs> there is a growing community because, as you say, just like with actually using an old motorcycle, mm-hmm. the the there's a great reward of being able to do something yourself with your hands, you know, there's a tangible reward with, you know, if you maintain your motorcycle, you get to ride it. If you mix your own chemistry for, to make photographs, you create this thing and it looks like nothing else because the sensitivity is in the ultraviolet range. You actually cannot literally see you on a wet plate photographs. Mm-hmm. So people look different. Their skin looks darker if they've got any pigment in them. You know, if there's any sunspots or anything on their skin that shows up really dark. So, Men love it. Makes every man look like a hero. <laughs> women, women hate it <laughs> because they don't want to look like a male hero. <laughs> so, and we shoot totally with natural light, and wow. uh, yeah, it's pretty neat. So, what have you got currently? You said you got about a dozen motorcycles. Yeah, all of them that you ride. Yeah. What would be give us some sort of a sampling of what those specific types would be and what years they are? I'm really curious to hear that. Ah, sure. Uh, they range from, I have a 1902 Clement uh, oh, l- hanging on a wall because it's basically a moped. and uh, But I bought it because it was so picturesque and totally original. And what's the country of origin on that? You guess. It's French. French. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I have, uh, let's see, I have, I have three Velocet KTT production racers from 1928 to 1949, one of which I rode on the Cannonball. Uh, I have a three triumph twins uh bonneville 65 bonneville and a 70 trophy and a, a 74 um trophy trail oh that's a nice which little is sampling a, which of is in triumph. mexico yeah Love they're it. fun yeah. those are great all-around bikes and, and you know i didn't have a real appreciation for them because i was much more of a single cylinder uh enthusiast in my 20s and 30s and really didn't get into owning and riding triumphs until kind of later and when I wasn't thrashing them so so hard (laughs) they're they're perfectly nice and I also have two other Velocets a Thruxton and a Clubman which are both their sporting models and I have uh, a bike that Von Dutch and Mm. uh, uh, Bud Eakins uh, built it's a 1947 standard it's a German overhead cam single that Bud uh, basically turned into a bob job and did a terrible job pinstriping. And uh, <laughs> I picked that up a few years ago. It's like, uh, you know, early, early custom vehicles. I, I imagine it's true with cars too. In original condition are rare as hen's teeth. Let's go back to Bud Aikens. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't he the stunt double for Steve McQueen? Yep. Is that, am I thinking of the right guy? You are thinking of the right okay, guy. Okay, okay. He was also an expert writer. He was on the American ISDT team, I think four or five times and won big bear enduro and lots and lots and lots of races. He was a real pro and he was really uh, Steve McQueen's mentor and very good friend. And uh, he and Von Dutch were best friends and they actually kind of did work together originally. So basically at the origin of their friendship in the, in the, in the forties, uh, Von Dutch would do the mechanics and Bud would do the painting and they soon realized they were both terrible and they, they switched, switched roles. roles. Just love the story. Go. <laughs> Good story. <laughs> and Bud went on to become, uh, after he retired racing, he became kind of the biggest uh, motorcycle builder for Hollywood. So Fonzie's Triumph was built by, oh, and owned okay. by, yeah, yeah. or I should say all three Fonzie's Triumphs mm-hmm. were built by Bud. So mm-hmm. legendary character. Anything out there on your wish list uh-huh. that you're after? Unicorns, holy grails, or just something that you think is cool? Uh, like I say, I'm 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 not really a collector anymore. Okay. So I'm I'm pretty happy with with where things are. Yeah, of course. You know, I look at things all the time and I think, oh wow, that would be cool. I'd like to try that. But at the moment, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> well, I know you don't collect, but let's talk about the collecting world, the contemporary collecting world of motorcycles. What are the trends? What are you seeing? What's hot? What's what's cooling off? What's yeah. What's 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 it look like for the next for for this year when it comes to motorcycles? Well, well looking at the Meekum auctions, you know, this week in Las <laughs> right. Vegas, it's uh, things are hot. Uh, but on the whole, I mean, basically, I see the younger generation not so interested in in motorcycles, old okay. motorcycles, or motorcycles in general. Um, so, like for everyday mass production motorcycles, the prices have dropped probably in half in the last seven years. Like it, you. Uh, uh, 
59 Bonneville used to be $28,000. I think you can pick one up for fifteen or $16,000 now. A Vincent Black Shadow used to be $180,000. I think you could pick up the same bike for about 80 these days. So there's that. But if a bike is special, rare, blue chip, uh, agreed upon as a world's best, the prices are just going up and up and up in line with the car world. Like there doesn't seem to be a limit it's been interesting watching uh, uh, how prices have risen in the motorcycle world. So there are a few million dollar motorcycles out there. A lot of those are from private sales. Actually, I don't think we've seen a motorcycle break a million at an auction yet. They've recall, come very, yeah. very close. Nine hundred eighty thousand dollars for a Vincent Black Lightning a few years ago, but um, you know, private sales, yes, lots and. Uh, so the blue chip stuff just keeps going up and up, and I see that trend continuing, you know, kind of the agreed upon world's best. Uh, but in general, if you're looking for an old motorcycle, it's a great time to buy one because there's a lot of restored bikes out there. And, they, you know, a lot of the big, big, big collectors are getting older and selling off. And it's amazing how many people on this planet have 500 motorcycles in a warehouse. <laughs> A couple of trends I want to get your thoughts on that that I've been looking at the past couple of years, totally dissimilar. Uh, the first trend I want your comment on are the extremely high prices of the multi-cylinder brass era, pre-World War I motorcycles. So hold that thought for a moment. And then kind of finish up your thoughts in regard to what's happening right now, particularly with 70s uh, Japanese motorcycles, especially the high horsepower motorcycles, the Kawasaki Z1, Honda 750s. And then as we go into the 80s and 90s, good examples of those bikes that were just used bikes a few years ago are starting to get collectible now. For sure. I mean, just to address that first, basically there are so many threads in, in the collecting world, as you know, and so many motivations to collect. And the 70s, 80s Japanese thing is because the People who wanted those bikes when they were young, they're older now. They have, you know, good jobs. They have a little bit of expendable income because their kids are out of the house and yep. they're willing to spend thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars on a very special bike that was special when it was new. You know, we're not talking about just kind of the run of the mill bikes, although they've gone up in value too. But, you know, if it was the world's fastest motorcycle when it came out in nineteen seventy nine or nineteen eighty nine, everybody wanted one and they didn't sell a whole lot of them. So uh, those are the bikes that are you know, being collectible. So that's one thread okay. of collecting. There's another thread of collecting that are the kind of the blue chip, chip investors who are just looking for the best of the best, you know, throughout history. And then there are antique buffs, you know, and, and there's, I see a couple of different types of antique buffs. You know, if you're talking about kind of brass era motorcycles, there's people who don't care if it's, uh, if it's a fully restored and maybe part replica or maybe like something mm. you'd put in your office, you know, there's a price point for those machines and you see a lot of them, especially recreations of board track bikes from the teens, uh, many, many, many recreations out there and they have a, a value, you know, 35 to $50,000. Everybody agrees on that. It's fine. Uh, but if it's an original paint, uh, anything even deteriorated, even deteriorated a okay. hundred years old people, that's a different collector who really um, values authenticity above everything, even aesthetics, you mm -hmm. know? So you can have a pretty roached looking, let's say 1904 Curtis and boy, you know, it doesn't matter because it's real. You know, I used to do faux finishing my head. I was a contract for 25 years. You know, I was an expert at color and finishes. I could make anything look like anything. And I know, how to make a, a motorcycle look old. I've never actually done it, but I have done it with wood and all sorts of things. And I know when people do it, because I can see it was my business, you cannot fake, really, you really cannot fake uh, that kind of patina, you know, especially the, the more far gone vehicles. Any events coming up uh, this year that you're going to be a part of, Paul, or that people can see you at? Well, you can always keep track of me on thevintagent.com uh, or at the Vintagent on Facebook or Instagram. But um, I've got a lot going on this year. <laughs> it's going to be a big year. Uh, I've got uh, opening April 14th at the Peterson Museum is my fifth exhibit for them. It's called Electric Revolutionaries. It's focusing mm, on cool. a dozen designers who have kind of stuck their neck out in the EV space which is a lot safer to do in the car world than the motorcycle world. I mean, only Harley Davidson still has produced a full-size electric motorcycle of the big, 
you know, the big brands. And that's that's the live wire, right? The live wire, okay. right. Um, so, yeah, we'll have a dozen designers. Mm-hmm. Harley is a sponsor, but we have a lot of independents. We even got a 17-year-old kid from Ghana who made a mm-hmm. solar-powered electric scooter from trash. And I'm, I'm, we, I love his story so much. We're wow. bringing him over, and we're actually trying to find him an education. So... Because uh, I have a nonprofit called the Motorcycle Arts Foundation. Good for and, you, man. Uh, yeah, trying to do some good work and give back. Um, and uh, I'll be hosting the Quail Motorcycle Gathering uh, in uh, in May, early May. I think it's the 6th, sorry. That's a tradition um, for you, correct? Yeah, hey, I've done that since they started 11, 12 yeah. years ago. And uh, uh, and then at the end of May, uh, I'm, I've done a lot of multi-day kind of groovy hipster events like in central California where it was kind of invite only and fun people and basically industry influencers kind of hang around and talk with each other and go for rides and Mm. do fun stuff like set up drag races on an abandoned airstrip and stuff. Mm. Uh, And I decided (laughs) my last one was in 20, I think it was 2018. And I decided the next one was going to be all electric. So Mm. it just turned out that, um, you know, I, I work with, 10 people now I've got 10 people kind of building ideas uh, and next things to do. So the next one is called electric revolution. It's a three day festival in Walla Walla, Washington. It's all EV, all kinds of EV. And we're working with the guy, Ken Deans, who organized Coachella for 20 years. Oh yeah. And uh, he's contracted with the city of Walla Walla, which has been voted the number one wine destination in the country for two years in a row. Uh, uh, to, but nobody knows it. So they're trying to generate some interest and we're the first event that's going to be happening on Memorial day this year in May. So it'll be fun. We're going to have racing and fun races and kids races and wacky races. And, you know, it's going to be a blast. Any trips, uh, final question, any trips outside of the U S planned this year? <laughs> Typically, uh, the folks in Europe get to see you, you heading over that way or is that going to be on hold for now? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty bummed out. I was a, a judge at the, uh, Villa d'Este concours for 10 years, but BMW has decided to no longer produce, uh, or to do the motorcycle half of that event. So I'm out of that job, which kind of sucks because <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it was a sweet deal. Uh, but, uh, I generally go to, there's a, an amazing event uh, at the Montlary Speed Bowl just south of Paris, which is the oldest uh, banked oval still left standing and in use. And it's a pre-1930 event. It's called Vintage Revival Montlary. And uh, it's fantastic. I mean, you get people whose family has owned, let's say, a Bugatti Type 35 since new. And the granddaughter of the guy who raced it in Grands Prix is still driving the thing. And you know, there's a friend of mine whose grandfather raced a Veloset in the 30s, and she's still racing it. Wow. I mean, so it's very different there than here. You know, it's like the, the, what you might find in your garage <laughs> might be worth <laughs> millions and be a race car, but it's just grandpa's car, you know, and they still hammer around the track. It's, it's pretty amazing. Well, I think uh, all I can uh, say, John, is Paul is a renaissance man, if I've ever thought of one. Absolutely. We're defining one. World's most interesting motorcycle man. (laughs) Right here. For sure. I mean, if I have any 10-type photography questions, he's going to be the first guy I call. (laughs) Amen. Uh, But, uh, hey, it it really has been fun, Paul, getting to to know you, to hear about your world and all of its (laughs) multi-facets. And all I can say is I I think we're going to do this again, right, John? Yep, absolutely. Maybe next year we'll get you you revved up and get... Get, get caught up again. Much appreciated, Paul. Thank sure. you so much, buddy. Yeah, it's great chatting. You've been listening to Meekin Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. For more information, visit Meekin.com. And join us again next time as we take you inside the world of muscle and collector cars and more.